Guten Morgen. That's as much German as I know. Uh, putting on a conference like this is a lot of work. Uh, let's make some noise for the folks at CUTIE for, for doing such a great job. Okay, let's talk about how you make great user experiences, but we're not gonna talk about the mechanics of actually doing it. Instead, we're gonna talk about how companies have done it. And in particular, I wanna hone in on what was probably the biggest user experience investment that any company anywhere has ever made. It was a billion dollar investment for what was basically a wearable. This is the Disney Magic Band, and Disney spent more than a billion dollars on this device. Uh, and it, it doesn't measure how far you walk, and it doesn't measure your heartbeat, and it doesn't even measure the time, and it only works in three places on the planet. And yet, uh, it's an amazing user experience that comes out of this. Uh, for one thing, you can use, when it comes, it comes in this amazing box that is decorated up and is just a wonderful experience. Every band is personalized for the individual. The device itself is jam-packed with technology, three different radio transmitters, a GPS, a near field, and a uh, Bluetooth capability. Uh, that allows it to do things like unlock the room, when you get to the hotel, you don't even have to go to the front desk, you just go straight to your room and your bags are already there and uh, uh, you're able to unlock it. Uh, you can use it to get priority access to any of the rides and into the park. You can use it to pay for food and merchandise anywhere in the Disney campus, even when you intend to. And uh, my favorite feature is that if your child is celebrating their birthday, their favorite ca character will come and find them in the park and greet them by name. A little creepy, <laughs> but it's cool. Uber has taught us that uh, creepy and cool can go together. But the most amazing thing to me about this uh, magic band that Disney created was that it came from Disney. See, when I first started working with Disney back in 1997, we started looking at what they were doing. Uh, we were working often with the parks and resorts team, the, the part of Disney that's in charge of helping guests book reservations and have a great stay at Disney parks. And at the time, this was what they thought great design was. And this website, very 1997, uh, uh, was basically their customer service reservation system. They had just sort of sprinkled a little Tinkerbell dust on it and turned it around and said, customers, come and, and use this thing. And it was, it was really hard to use. It was very difficult to use. It was almost impossible to book a reservation on it. In fact, it was so difficult to use that we used to use it as a training tool to show people what not to do. <laughs> and one of the things that uh, we used to do is we used to train this practice that we still use today called usability testing. If you've never done a usability test, it's when you ask someone who's gonna use your design to actually use it in front of you so you can see where it works and where it doesn't. And we would train people, train developers and, and product managers and other folks to, to do testing by using the Disney site because one of the things that you wanna do when you're training people to do usability tests is you want something that's difficult to use so that they can, they can see what it's like to be a user. And we would run hundreds of people through this site as, as part of our training regimen. And we, we came up with a bunch of 
tasks that we would ask the participants in the studies to do. Uh, my favorite was based on a, uh, a woman who we'd met who had a six-year-old who loved trains. And she wanted to stay at Disney in such a place that, that they could ride the monorail train every day for everything they were going to do. So she wanted to know which hotel at Walt Disney World would be the cheapest hotel, because she wasn't a rich person, which hotel uh, is the cheapest that on the monorail. And so that became our test task. What's Walt Disney's world's least expensive hotel that's on the monorail? And if you know anything about Walt Disney World, there are only three hotels that qualify that are on the monorail, the Grand Floridian, the Contemporary Resort, and the Polynesian. And the Grand Floridian and the Contemporary Resort are wicked ass expensive. So the only answer to this is, in fact, the Polynesian Resort. But what was fascinating was how many people could not figure that out. Uh, when we would run this test over hundreds of participants out of every uh, 100 that we ran it with, it turned out that a full 10% of them uh, could, were, could succeed. 90% would fail figuring out that the Polynesian Resort was the, the best hotel. But what was even more surprising to us was that a full 20%, one out of every five people, would accidentally pick a hotel in Disneyland instead of Disney World. <laughs> now, for those of you not familiar with the Disney empire, there's a bit of a difference between Disneyland and Disney World. The biggest difference being that they are 45,100 kilometers apart. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, the, the big problem is that uh, we, would, we would ask them, so part of usability test training is that you, uh, when, when you see someone make a mistake, you just don't want to laugh at them at that moment. You save that for later. But you want to figure out, is the reason that they made the mistake because they didn't understand the instructions, or was it because they didn't understand how the, the website worked, or was it because they didn't understand uh, uh, that you wanted the correct answer? There may be lots of reasons why they didn't do it. So you have to ask some follow-up questions. And the follow-up question, we would train these product managers and developers and other people we were training to do usability testing. The follow-up question we train them on is, uh, can you take the monorail from that hotel that you just found to Epcot Center? And the participants in the study would uniformly, when asked that question, turn back to the machine, and they would click around the website for a few minutes, and then they would turn back to the person who was moderating the test, and they would say, yes, yes, you can. Now, to be clear, a monorail is a six-car train that travels at about 60 kilometers per hour. It has no restroom capability, and it has to go 4,500 kilometers. <laughs> you can't really take the train from there to that. But they, they were convinced of this. And I remember I was giving a talk, and I was talking about this phenomenon we kept seeing. And after the presentation, this woman approaches the stage, and she looks up to me, and she has a badge on. And it says, Walt Disney World Parks and Resorts. I say, hello. And she says, hi. She says, can I tell you something? I'm like, yeah. She says, you can't tell anyone. OK. She says, we regularly have people who show up in Florida with California reservations. <laughs> I do some checking, and I find out this is absolutely true. In fact, 
Disney keeps a set of rooms reserved. <laughs> Even at their busiest uh, moments, they keep this set of rooms reserved for people who show up with hotel rooms for the other side of the United States so that their vacation isn't ruined. That's how amazing Disney is. But what's even more amazing is that they think that keeping a set of rooms in their busiest season when they could easily sell those rooms for thousands of dollars, they keep those rooms aside because it's easier than fixing, fixing their damn website. <laughs> and that's where we were in 1997. And here we are in 2014, and Disney rolls out this magic band that is the most comprehensive, the most extensive, the most incredibly well-designed user experience project ever, and the most expensive one anyone has ever done. And, and somehow they'd gotten from that 1997 horrible website to this. And that's what interests me. How did they get there? To understand that, we first have to understand how anyone learns to do anything. And so when we try to do something new, something we've never done before, the process of doing that, we go through a bunch of stages. Now, it's something new, we've never done it before, so the first stage, we can't actually do what we want to do, so we're incompetent at it. And because we can't do it, we don't get good results most of the time, or it's just luck when we do. The problem is we can't tell the difference. We can't tell whether we're getting good results or not, and because it's something where we're getting any results, that's amazing to us. We call this stage unconscious incompetence. And unconscious incompetence is when you're not very good at what you do, and you don't know you're not very good at what you do. So you think you're great. And this doesn't matter what we're learning. It could be learning a new language. It could be learning uh, to cook. It could be learning to play a musical instrument. It could be learning design. But you go, you start, at, everybody starts at this point. Right? You just put stuff out. You cook things, you say things, you play things. It, ju it just happens. Now, usually, there's a moment when a good friend comes by and says, please stop. <laughs> you're not good at this. I know you think you are, but you're not. Please stop. And that's when we stop. That's when we... Uh, uh, realize all of a sudden that we are not good at this because there is a difference between good and bad. And at that moment, we enter the stage of conscious incompetence. We are still incompetent. We don't know how to do what we're doing. We just know this. We are aware that we are com incompetent. And this is where most people give up. All of us were amazing artists. Anything we drew would immediately be a candidate for the art gallery that was on our refrigerator. And our parents would put it up and they'd ooh and ah. And then as we got older, that stopped happening. And we realized maybe we're not as good as we think we are. And we stopped. And that is where most people give up. But some people persist. And they start to learn the rudiments, the scales, the basics, the grammar, and they begin to become uh, a little smarter, a little better at what they can do, and they start to get decent outcomes. They start to cook food people like to eat, they start to play music people like to listen to, and suddenly we are now in the realm of conscious competence. As long as I pay attention, as long as I follow the recipe, as long as I think about where every finger goes on the instrument, I can do what I need to do. And that's a great place to be. And now we're producing good outcomes and we're getting uh, good results based on just focusing on what we're trying to do, conscious competence. And then at some point, 
we realize that we don't have to think about it anymore. We just are able to do it. And suddenly, we're at this point where we can produce great results without giving it much thought. We just walk into the situation and we can assess it. And we know instinctively what to do. And that instinctiveness comes from tons of practice, tons of effort. And at that moment, we get to the last stage, which is called unconscious competence. And unconscious competence is when we just know how to produce great results without having to think about it. Now we can think about this in terms of transitions. The transition from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence is really about literacy. It's understanding that there is a good, there is a bad, and there's a, and there's a way to, to, to deal with that. But you don't know how to deal with it. Knowing how to deal with it comes in the next stage. That's when we go from conscious incompetence to uh, conscious competence. And that's what we call fluency. Now we're able to combine parts of the grammar. We're able to figure out how to play notes in sequence. We can cook things at a decent time. And so that's the sort of fluency part of this. And getting from conscious competence to unconscious competence, this is being able to handle situations that you don't have recipes for, that you don't have music for. And suddenly we are now in the realm of mastery. We're able to master our craft. So anytime anybody talks about mastering their craft, what they're really talking about is that last transition from conscious competence to unconscious competence. And this is all well and good, but we're talking about how a person does this. And I started by asking the question about Disney. How did Disney learn to do this? And to understand that, we have to go to the sort of business equivalent of this, the organizational equivalent. And in the organizational equivalent, we have to think about, OK, how does Disney learn how to do UX design? Well, it turns out that there are stages here, too. The first stage we call the Dark Ages. <laughs> in the Dark Ages, the organization is so focused on getting anything out that they're not thinking about what the user's experience is. They are just trying to deliver something because that's what they've been asked to do. And that in itself is enough work. They're focused on their technology, they're focused on their business, and they're not thinking about what's that experience that the user has. But someone often at this point will join the organization or realize that, hey, we could do better, we could actually put something out that users like to use. And at that point, they transition into another stage, which is called Spot UX. This is when there are little pockets within the organization that, for a moment, focus on a good user experience. But for whatever reason, the business doesn't let it hold, and it gets stuck, and they stop, and they're not capable of going forward. That ends typically that when uh, someone on the executive team, someone with some power and influence, is able to say, look, we really do need to focus on our users. They're complaining quite a bit. Uh, it would be a good business for us to do this. And they start to make some investment in user experience. And usually what happens is they hire a manager who then builds a small team. And that team's job is to basically help the rest of the organization start producing better designed products and services. And that stage is called UX design as a service. And this is where a lot of organizations spend their time. They, they are constantly building up this team of designers and researchers and other individuals whose job it is to make better products and services. And we used to think that this was the pinnacle. If we could build this up, if we could have that manager have a high-placed role in the organization, and every team would use the design services that this, this team would provide, that would be fantastic. But we realized that there was an inflection point. And that inflection point happens when the teams that the design team is working with actually start to lose their patience with the design team because they can't get enough of them. Right? The centralized team is a constrained resource, and they can't have enough designers to support all the engineers and uh, product people that are out there. And those engineers and product people are realizing, hey, our product would be better designed if we had our own designer. And at that moment, 
they move to a new stage, which we call embedded UX design. And this is when the product teams themselves bring on their own designers and their own researchers, and they're trying to create great design themselves, independent of what that centralized organization is doing. And when we discovered this, we thought, okay, well, this is the ideal. The ideal is that we get designers on every team, and then suddenly now we're in a great place. But we realized there was one more inflection point. And that inflection point happened when people who didn't think of themselves as designers, developers, product managers, various stakeholders, are starting to make good design decisions because they've been paying attention and they're now fluent in design themselves. And so now, not every decision is made by the designer. Not every decision is made by the developer. And we're now in this stage called infused UX design. And this is when the organization is so thinking about design that every design decision, from what features are included to how a field is represented on screen, turns out to be an informed, thoughtful, well designed. Now, for those of you who are UX designers, some of you uh, uh, may be asking, well, if everybody can do this, what do I do? Well, I'll tell you what you can do. Instead of spending all your time creating wireframes of what every possible state of a dialog box looks like, because you don't trust the developers, who happen to be sitting right next to you, by the way, uh, uh, to do this well, you can now just sketch an idea on a whiteboard and the developer can go, oh yeah, sure, I get it. They can go off, create something, you look at it and go, that's fantastic. And meanwhile, you're actually solving the really hard problems of your product and service that you haven't been getting to because you have to spend all your time creating wireframes of 20 different states of when the dialog box is open, when the dialog box is closed, all those things. That's what infused UX design is. We're now able to tackle the really hard, complex problems that our users have. So this is where Disney was back in 1997. They were in the dark ages. They had no idea there was a difference between good and bad design, at least not on websites. As far as they were concerned, a website was an amazing thing. And if they could just get it delivered, that's all they needed to do. Yet when they shipped the Magic Band, in order to pull that off, they had to be in that state where everybody understood what a great user experience was. And that difference between being in the dark ages and being in infused UX design, that was the journey Disney took. And in case you're wondering, it was 17 years long. So if you find yourself somewhere on this diagram and you have spent less than 17 years getting there, you're ahead. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Now, I need to point out that Disney is an organization. And you really can't actually put the entire organization on this chart, because organizations themselves are, in fact, made of teams. And when we look at where teams fall, we'll find in any given organization, teams fall all over the map. Some are more mature than others. And that really, if you want to be an organization that is very mature, you have to get every team to be more mature. Yet some teams are still in the dark ages. Some teams are still at spot UX design. And so if we want to get those teams to be more mature, we have to dig a little deeper. Because it turns out that teams are, in fact, made of people. Everything is made of people at some level. It's sort of the Soylent Green law of physics. And the thing about this is that teams are actually made of a special kind of people. We call them influencers. These are the people who influence the design. And they may not realize they are making design decisions, but deciding to put that feature in or take that feature out, deciding that the Di uh, dialog box has to appear that says, yes, I agree to cookies. This is my experience coming to Europe, is that for every minute I'm here, I'm always agreeing that, uh, about the cookie policy. <laughs> at the, they have cookies at the Christmas market, and I had to agree to their cookie policy before I could have one. <laughs> the, uh, 
this, these decisions are decisions that are made by people who have influence but often don't understand anything about design. They have no design literacy, no design fluency. And they are the ones who create the design decisions that affect our user's experience. And so while we may have a designer who is fairly mature on the team, we have a bunch of other influencers who are all over the board. And we used to think that the way you could measure a team's effectiveness was by the person who was most mature. After all, that person would lead the team. But it turns out that when we did our research, that person had no effect whatsoever on the overall maturity of the team. And you can't measure the overall maturity by just averaging the maturity of all the individuals on the team. It turns out that the way you calculate the overall maturity of the team is based on the person who is least mature, the one who uh, uh, is most immature because that person is holding everybody else back. That person is creating a problem because they don't understand design. And it becomes important for people who are trying to lead the organization to make sure that we get that person and all the other influencers to be as fluent in design as possible. This becomes the design leader's most important challenge, to be able to make the organization as fluent in design is to make each team, which means make each individual as fluent in design as they possibly can. Now, I want to go back a little bit further to the 1950s when a company named Honeywell released a product which they called the H model thermostat. And this became a canonical design element. It was really the first sort of industrial design element to go into people's houses that had been thoughtfully designed. And it was created by a designer named Henry Dreyfus. And Dreyfus and his team put together hundreds of prototypes on uh, this thing, and the one they settled on was this sort of beautiful, iconic design. And Honeywell went on to sell millions and millions and millions of these thermostats, and that sort of round shape dictated what thermostats would look like for, for a really long period. And they sort of held on to this lead of the thermostat industry until 2011, when a company named Nest came out with their thermostat. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, it's a new EU law that if you have a presentation on design, you must talk about the nest. <laughs> so I have now complied with EU regulations. <laughs> but I'm not going to talk about what makes the nest amazing. It's, it's, it is, it's also, you know, this uh, way for Google, who owns Nest, to, to, to look into your house and learn about you. So it's sort of an eye of Sauron in that regard. But <laughs> it's creepy, but it's cool. <laughs> but the, the thing that I'm most interested in about the Nest is how come Honeywell didn't invent it. Honeywell owned this market. Honeywell was the leader here. How come they didn't invent the nest? This is a really important question because if we really want to understand how to bring great design out, we have to understand how we don't end up like Honeywell. Now, to dive into this, we have to know about one more growth maturity chart, and that is how the market matures. You see, marketplaces have a different path than the companies themselves. As much as the companies would like to force the market, the market is actually controlled by the consumers. And it starts when a new technology comes out, say a cell phone. This is the Motorola uh, StarTac, uh, and it was a $4,000 device that weighed uh, uh, four pounds and uh, 
you had to shout in it to make it work. And it, it was really sort of this awkward big thing that you held up against your head. But people loved this thing. They thought this was awesome. And they sold a ton of them. And it basically launched what is now the mobile phone industry, was this device. And but you, if you wanted one, you had to buy this one, because it was the only one that was out there. So there was, there was really no choice in the consumer's marketplace until a competitor shows up. And when a competitor shows up, suddenly there are all sorts of choices to have. And the way that they distinguish themselves is on features. They keep adding features. Feature here, feature there, feature, 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 feature. And suddenly you have all sorts of features in the products. And that keeps happening until users get, and customers get fed up by having the features because none of the features that people are adding are things they care about. This is how we got the paperclip in Microsoft Word, right? It's like, well, we have to put something in it. Well, let's create a talking paperclip. Okay. We talked to customers everywhere, and they said, you know what's missing? A talking paperclip. <laughs> Just keep adding things, kids. Just keep adding things. And suddenly now, we're focused on experience. Experience uh, uh, drives what people buy. And they're like, I just want a phone that is easy to use. And that's what created the iPhone. Six months before the iPhone came out, Nokia came out with a phone called the N95. And it was this amazing, uh, amazing, amazing phone, except that uh, it had so many features, nobody knew how to make it work. And the iPhone, when it came out, had far fewer features. This is one of the, the key things. Whoever comes out with the new, the new thing that is based on experience often has fewer features because they've picked just the right features that the customer wants. And they get rid of all the rest. I remember when the iPhone first came out, it didn't have uh, the ability to send pictures in a text message or take movies or cut and paste or any or apps. They didn't exist in version one. None of those things existed yet. And yet the, uh, uh, the, the phone just flew off the shelves. And this stage continues until the thing gets subsumed into a bigger experience. Nobody buys a phone to make phone calls anymore. Right? It's not part of the experience of a phone. It's not what, what people care about. They want a bigger set of experiences from that. And that's what we call the commodity stage, when the product gets actually plugged into something else and the actual original intent is no longer what people care about. But this stage itself has its own sort of levels of experience. There's a company called GoGo, which makes in-flight Wi-Fi for airplanes. And they got into a lawsuit with American Airlines a couple years back when American sued them to break their 10-year contract because GoGo's performance, the capability and the user experience of using the GoGo in-flight was hurting American Airlines flight experience so bad that customers were saying that they were actually choosing other car air airlines to fly on, other carriers, to uh, instead of flying on American Airlines. So American was claiming damages and saying that this was a breach of contract and they wanted to break their 10-year contract in the fifth year. And they were right. The experience was horrible. The judge decided that they can't, couldn't uh, break the contract because, as the, in the judge's words, who is stupid enough to sign a 10-year contract for Wi-Fi service? <laughs> But GoGo, they settled and GoGo decided to upgrade their service and now the, the, they're doing better. But this is, this is amazing, right? This, this technological thing that's embedded in this airplane is what's driving customers away from flying on the airline, right? Imagine your product, you know, you make a speedometer for a car, it's like, yeah, I'm not buying that car. 
right? That's the problem. And so, so this, this notion that the experience is a big thing is, is huge. Now, if we want to create this sort of experience or commodity level stuff, we have to be on the far right side of this maturity model. We have to be at or close to infused UX design in order to actually get to that level because we really have to understand all the things that go into the user's experience to be able to be the leader there. Which brings me back to my question. Why didn't Honeywell do that? What prevented them from being that leader? They own the market. Why did Nest come out and make this happen? Well, we can say that, well, that H model, it was definitely a technology play in 1953 when it first showed up on the, on the market. Henry Dreyfus uh, uh, designed this thing, and it was to match the technology. And for sure, they tried to do programmable stuff, and they tried features, but none of the features really took on. It never captured the imagination of their customers. And it was the Nest that figured out how to do that by having this device that you didn't have to program, but in fact would just learn the habits of the person in the house and adjust itself based on whether you were moving around or not moving around or making noise or not making noise. And so, uh, uh, so that's the idea behind the Nest. But what's more interesting is on this model because Honeywell had hired Dreyfus and his team as contractors in 1953. And it was basically just this one-time project that they worked on. They hired Henry Dreyfus, he came and did his thing, and he left. And Henry did what all great designers eventually do. He died. <laughs> no, seriously, they all do that. You watch, it'll happen. <laughs> they never learned how to do design from Henry Dreyfus. They figured, well, they could just hire him back. Whereas the Nest, the Nest figured it out. They knew how to do great design. Everybody at Nest knew how to do great design. Now, there are people who say, well, Honeywell's a big company. They don't really care about this. They don't care about these things. Well, okay, maybe they don't. But, you know, Google did for $3.2 billion. My guess is Honeywell shareholders would have rather that value go to Honeywell, not to Google. So uh, there's probably some caring that needed to happen. But we, we're, we're still not getting to the answer. Right? How is it that Nest pulled this off? Part of it is that Nest was a startup, and startups seem to have this magical quality that they can pick where on the maturity model they want to start. We had thought that every company had to go through this from the beginning, but startups don't seem to have that, that need. They don't have that requirement. And we're like, why not? And so we had a bunch of theories to try and figure out why was it that that startups sort of get to pick where they go. And the first theory we had was what we called the stem cell theory. And if you know anything about embryonic stem cells, there are these cells that are in embryos, and, uh, as the, and their entire purpose is basically just to reproduce. They just, they just divide and they subdivide again and they subdivide again to try and make as big an embryo as possible. But at some point in that process, they change function. Those same cells don't die off they actually become different cells. Some cells become liver cells, some cells become stomach cells, some cells become colon cells, and the cells themselves start to act differently. And we thought, well, maybe that's how startups work, that, that startups start out in this sort of embryonic stage where they're just there to exist, and then um, over time, they take on function and they become part of what they need to become, and they can become anywhere they want on here. And this made perfect sense to us because we knew a lot of startups who acted like colons. <laughs> but it turns out that the theory was much simpler than that. It wasn't the right theory at all. Here was this theory. 
Here's, here's how it actually worked. Nest was started by a guy named Tony Fidel. Tony Fidel just happened to be the guy who was the lead designer on Apple's iPod, on Apple's iPhone, and on Apple's iPad products. And Tony did what other startup founders do. He stole all his former teammates from Apple and brought them to Nest. So everybody working on the product had worked on the iPod and the iPhone and the iPad, and they knew how to work with Tony, and they knew great design. And then as the company expanded, because they were hiring everybody, they just made sure that everybody in the company knew something about design. Even if you were applying for a job in accounting, you'd have to know something about design, because that was part of the culture and the ethos of Nest. So everybody in the company already knew about design, so they just started as design infused because they hired people that way. Honeywell, on the other hand, Honeywell was a large company, and like most large companies, they had people who were all over the spectrum. So as a result, they had people who had no idea what design was. They had people who had a little bit of idea how what design was, all the way across. Honeywell's choices were either to spend a tremendous amount of resources training these people up, or to just fire them all and hire new people who know about design. Neither of those are appealing choices. And the third choice that they have is to do nothing and just be Honeywell and know nothing about design. And that's what cost them the nest. They just were not in a place to go there because they didn't understand. Now there's one more inflection point that I wanted to tell you about. And that inflection point happens when the company is at a point where it needs to ship a product to its customers. And it will ship the product because it works technically and because it meets the business requirements. That's all that's necessary. If the product's not well designed, that's okay. We'll fix it in the next release. Right? We just need to get it out there. We need to get people using it. We'll fix it in the next release. I think that was Microsoft's motto at one point. We'll just fix it in the next release. And it turns out that, that that's how companies exist most of their lives. But some companies, some companies hit the inflection point. And the inflection point happens when suddenly they realize that even though it works technically and meets the business needs, it can't ship until it also is a well-designed product. And that moment when that company shifts to that criteria, we call the UX tipping point. The UX tipping point is when the user experience is now such an important thing in the organization that it is what holds products back. The Disney Magic Band was two years late. They could have shipped it two years earlier in 2012. The band would open up the hotel room doors and it would have a limited amount of functionality being able to pay for things in the park but they didn't have the VIP ride access, they didn't have the ability to track people down on the GPS, they didn't have many of the features that they envisioned for the final product. And this was a billion dollar product that they were keeping ultra hyper secretive because they were so desperately afraid that a competitor, Universal or Six Flags or one of the other entertainment companies would learn they were doing this, come out with a cheap knockoff, get there first, everybody would go, oh, look at the cool thing they did, and then when Disney came out with theirs, it'd be like, oh, Disney just copied Universal. So they were keeping this thing ultra secret. They were desperately trying to figure out how to get it out, and they waited two years with the board asking questions every day about this billion dollar expense that they had gone through. Imagine being in charge of product for this thing getting those questions from Michael Eisner and the other board members every day about, are we ready yet? Are we ready now? Are we ready now? 
billion dollars. Are we ready now? <laughs> and yet, the organization as a whole understood that they could not ship this until it was done. That's the UX tipping point. When you get to that level of maturity, where everybody understands enough about great design that they can make that call from the executive team all the way down, that is where, that's the epitome of where we're trying to get to. So how do we get there? Well, we can think of our process, our design process, as the way we control the work. And these days, everybody fetishes over design process. Everybody's talking about design process. It's the thing that we talk about all the time. To the point where we ask candidates in interviews, what's your design process? as if we will ever let them use their own design process. Hell, we're barely gonna let them use our design process, because we don't have a design process. But we think if we had a design process, that would solve all our problems, because all you'd have to do is pull back the ball and let it go, and it would just continue on and do the thing in this incredibly uh, uh, controlled fashion. But that's not how design process works. The way that teams get design done is instead they have to deal with the situation. This is a football field. And when the team comes running out onto the football field, they don't have a giant Gantt chart that shows exactly which players will score at which minutes in the game. Milos, you have to score at four minutes and 22 seconds, because that's where you scored last time, and it worked really well. <laughs> right? It doesn't work that way. Instead, the team comes out onto the football pitch, and they have to take into account the situation. They have to know what their strengths are, what their opponent's weaknesses are. They have to understand who's injured or who's gonna fake injuries. They have to understand uh, 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 where the, uh, what the weather is and what the conditions are and whether the, the, the Brazilians have that stupid horn thing and, and all of these things, right? All of these things fall into the uh, how they assess what's going on. It's very much about being adaptable to whatever the situation is. That's how they win. And we've forgotten this. We, in our desire to have everything be controlled, we forget that actually it's about adaptability. It's about being flexible. And so we have to think in terms of what we call plays. These, these things that the team runs out onto the field with that they have practiced together, but they don't know which ones they're going to do until they get into the moment and they say, okay, this is the way we're gonna play this. And in design, there are different plays. Depending on whether we're literate or we're fluent or we're on the way to mastery, we actually do different things. We've identified more than 130 different plays that teams can use. This is just a small set of them, but they're different depending on where we are in our maturity so that we can actually get to where we need to be. The things that got us this far are not the things that will get us to the next level. So here are three plays that are most effective uh, for many organizations. The first play is one of what we call immersive exposure. And immersive exposure is when we get the key influencers and stakeholders to have direct contact with real users using our products and services. 
This is a literacy play because in watching these people interact with the products, we learn where the product works well and where it works poorly, and now we have a sense of what good design is and what bad design is. What we have is bad design. What the users want is good design. So we can understand that difference. Now, usability testing is a great way to get started with this. It's a, it's a good first step. But we need to go further. We need to go into the field. We need to see how these things are being used. If we're creating medical devices, we need to actually see the doctors and technicians and nurses interacting with the device, understanding what's going on. And the amount of exposure we found that makes a difference, the minimum amount is two hours every six weeks for each influencer. So if we really want to have those influencers understand what great design is, we need to make sure that every six weeks they are spending at least two hours watching people. Now it can be one two-hour session or it can be eight 15-minute sessions. It turns out it doesn't matter. You just have to spend enough time in the field to actually see problems happen and to see that the things we're working on may or may not match up with the problems people are actually experiencing. And you have to do that frequently enough so that people keep talking about it. Anyone who's been watching their users, actually seen this, knows that it's an amazing experience to see what they understand and what they don't understand. But if that experience is too far in the past, we don't take that into account when we're making decisions. So you need at least every six weeks to keep it present, to keep it going. Now, the, the way that we like to think about this is uh, we can think in terms of what that journey is that our users are going through. We can map out, for instance, the different things that a user has to do in using our product or service. And we can put that on a scale of extreme frustration to extreme delight. And we can ask the question, okay, for each step, are they delighted or are they frustrated? First step, they were really delighted, but then the next two steps, they were pretty frustrated, and then the next one, they were pretty delighted, but then it turned to real frustration again. And so now we have a picture of what it's like to be our user. And everybody in the, who's, who's been exposed to this has the same understanding. And that shared understanding allows us to have a conversation of what would it take to get these frustrating bits to be delightful? So that's immersive exposure. The next is what we call a shared experience vision. And a shared experience vision it allows us to make sure that we are getting everybody on the same page as to what this product would be like to use in the future. It, it, what would it be like to make the, uh, the product delightful all the way? And this is very much something that helps teams both with literacy, because understanding the difference between the current experience and the future one helps us understand the difference between good and bad, but also fluency as we try and actually create methods for getting to that delightful process. And you can think of this as a flag in the sand on the horizon that everybody can see. And because everybody can see it, you can give them the instructions take baby steps towards the flag. And it doesn't matter where they are in the organization, just the ability to take baby steps towards the flag will be a huge improvement. Now, how do you figure out what this vision is, what, what the experience of using our product or service might be like five years from now, that flag in the sand? Well, we can go back to that journey map, and we can use that journey map and say, what if we made it delightful all the way across? What if we had this aspirational vision that allowed us to make it completely delightful? That would be the vision that we're marking. That's the flag in the sand. And we say, okay, what are the baby steps that are gonna to have to take us there? How are we gonna improve these frustrating bits to get to that delightful experience? That's a shared experience vision. The last uh, of the most effective plays is what we call creating a culture of continuous learning. Now, 
In order to be able to get our teams to understand who our users are, what they're trying to do, we have to put a process in place so that we're always learning about what the users need, what they want, what the process, what, what is effective, what's frustrating. And the problem here is that we often, these days, fet fetish about failure. We, we get on these kicks where it's all about failure. You see this all the time. We need to fail quickly. We need to move fast and break stuff. We need to fail often. Everybody's trying to fail all the time. But deep down, nobody really wants to be called into the CEO's office to explain why they had a massive failure. Can you explain why you failed? Actually, it was on purpose. <laughs> it's part of our design process. In fact, we were afraid you didn't, wouldn't notice, so we made the failure really big. <laughs> nobody really wants to fail. But people say, well, you can't learn anything unless you fail. That's not true. We know it's not true. We've all met people who seem to fail all the time and never seem to learn a damn thing from it. <laughs> you absolutely don't need to fail to learn something. So this is the question we want the CEO to ask us. So what did we learn? That's a great question. We can list all the amazing things we learned. And we need to have a place where this is the question that's always being asked. What have we learned? Because sure, we can learn from failure, but we can also learn without failing. That would be even better. Learning how to minimize risk, how to mitigate risk, that's a great thing. Risk mitigation is a very powerful tool which you cannot learn if your goal is to fail big and often. So, we have lots of different ways to do this. One way that we've used back at Center Center, we, we have this school in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where we're creating uh, UX designers. And every day, the students and the faculty and the staff get together for a stand-up. And they answer the sort of normal questions that you answer in a stand-up. What, what have you accomplished? What are you planning to accomplish? What's your highest priority? What's the stuff that's preventing you from getting stuff done? Those are the questions I answer. But we added a fifth question. And the fifth question is, what's the most important thing that you've learned, and how will it change what you will do in the future? This question every day forces every one of our staff members, from the CEO all the way down, to talk about what they've learned, what they didn't know the day before, and how learning that thing will cause them to behave differently in the future. And as a result, they learn new things all the time. This is fantastic. When every member of the team is hearing how everybody in the organization is learning new things all the time, you create a culture of continuous learning. And you force that hand to say, look, we don't know what we need to know today, but we could tomorrow if we spent some time learning. So these strategies, these three plays, out of the 130 that we have, are the ones we often start with because they are the most effective with most teams. But there's 127 more that you pick depending on your situation. And we're learning new ones every day. But because of focusing on these things, you too can create a product like the Disney Magic Band, where a six-year-old walking up to that device, which is called the Magic Mickey, puts their magic band up against it. The magic, band detect, the, the magic Mickey detects the band's presence, makes this colorful, swirling uh, graphic, this beautiful sound plays, and because everybody who works for Disney in a 10-foot radius knows what's going on, they hear the sound, and they all turn, and they look at the kid at the Magic Mickey, and they say, happy birthday, Angela. That's really cool. A little creepy. <laughs> but definitely cool. 
That's a great user experience. So if you want to get to the UX tipping point and beyond, you have to understand that people learn from going from unconscious incompetence through conscious uh, uh, competence. And we have to get at least everybody there, if not finally to unconscious competence. We need to understand that our organizations have to mature and that different teams are at different places. And we need to push through to first UX design as a service, then embedded UX design, and then finally off to infused UX design. And to do that, we're gonna need a playbook that is filled with strategies that allow us to become design driven. That's what I came to talk to you about. Now, uh, we talk about the strategies that we have in a, in a workshop that we've put together. We hold it in the United States every couple of months. We have it next week and then in February. Uh, and we've also this year started bringing it to the UK. In 2019, we're gonna bring it to UK, probably to Germany at some point, and also to Australia, which is far away. <laughs> from no matter where you are, even if you're in Australia, it's still far away. <laughs> but you can join us and you can find out more information uh, uh, for this uh, at the website playbook.uie.com. UIE.com, by the way, is where we have lots of information about uh, everything I've talked about, articles, and we have a library of videos, and including a copy of this presentation that you can share with folks. Uh, uh, if you work in design and we're not connected on LinkedIn, please connect to me on LinkedIn. You can just look me up, Jared Spool, or use this email address. And finally, you can follow me on Twitter, where I tweet about design, design experience, design uh, strategy, and uh, the amazing experiences that the airline industry uses for customer service. And uh, uh, that's what I came to talk to you about. Thank you very much for encouraging my behavior. <laughs> <laughs>